Sergeant Burgess, are we ready to proceed? Yes, Your Honor. Your Honor, this is going to be position number 18 on the prelim here in this column of A, Judge Basewood. Let's take a call to Detective Jennifer Bennett, the Roswell Police Department. You saw Ms. Well, finally, the testimony about the gift post court of law be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, sir. You got it. Yes, sir. Please have you seated and state your name for the record. Thank you. My name is Jennifer Bennett. I work at the Roswell Police Department. And in what position are you assigned at that? I am a detective at the department. And what do you do as a detective? I work typically crimes against persons cases, which includes any type of crime that would occur against anybody. So you also investigate homicides? I do. And how long have you been doing that? I have been a investigator with Roswell since 2009, except for one year when I was away from the department. And are you post certified? I am. And have you been post certified during all of 2016? I have. In August, of 2016, earlier this month, do you recall investigating a homicide that occurred on or around 885 Woodstock Road? Yes. And what is that, that address? That is a shopping center in our city. There's a grocery store and several other stores there. And in what county is 885 Woodstock Road? It's in Fulton County. Is it firmly within Fulton County? It is. And where property of 885 Woodstock Road did this homicide occur? It was at the rear of some of the additional stores next to the area of the grocery store. And what grocery store is that? It's a Publix grocery store. And on what specific day earlier this month did this homicide occur? It occurred on August 1st. Approximately what time? It occurred in the early morning hours of August 1st. And was there a 911 call? There was. And what was the nature of that 911 call? We received a 911 call from a delivery driver to the grocery store. Um, he called in that he believed that there were two bodies on the ground next to a couple of vehicles. He said it appeared um, that one was male and one was female and that there was blood on the male's head. And police responded to the scene? They did. And what did they discover on arrival at the scene? They did discover just that, that there were two vehicles on scene. Um, there were two bodies, that of a male and a female, um, and both victims appeared to have trauma to their head. And what? were the names of this male and female? Uh, we were able to identify them as Natalie Henderson and Carter Davis. And did you respond to the scene? I did. And about what time was that? Uh, I arrived at the scene after 7 o'clock. And what did you observe on arrival to the scene? Um, initially, we started extra work, not the actual scene. Um, and then the crime scene investigators allowed me to enter the scene um, and I did observe the same thing. The two vehicles were there, uh, both unsecured, with two bodies, a male and female, laid out nearest to each of the vehicles. Okay, and in what condition were the male and female? They were deceased. And how were they dressed? The female had no clothing on. The male, we could see that he was wearing some black basketball-type shorts. And where were they? They were laid out on the ground outside of the cars. Approximately how far from each other were they? Uh, one parking space. And were you able to find any shell casings or projectiles on the scene? We did find what appeared to be one projectile, but no casings. And where was that projectile? It was nearest to the black vehicle that was parked nearest to the male victim. And was there any surveillance video? There was. And did you review the surveillance video? We did. And what did it reveal? Um, we were able to observe two vehicles driving into the back of the shopping center, which were the two vehicles that were nearest to the victims when we found them. A uh, very short time later, we observed a male subject coming from around the side of the building. Um, he's then caught on another camera, continuing to the area where the victims um, were located. And then a short time later, that person comes running back out. And about an hour later, that person comes back spends a short time back there and leaves again. And what was the description of this person? What did this person look like? We were able to see in the surveillance video that it appeared to be a white male with longer brown hair. Um, he was wearing a dark in color jacket, a red in colored shirt, 
lighter colored pants, and dark shoes. And were you able to identify any vehicles that were associated with this individual as revealed by the surveillance video? Yes, we did eventually obtain additional surveillance video um, that showed both the victim's vehicles driving to the back of the Publix and then showed another vehicle come and park in the Publix parking lot. And at what time did this other vehicle come and park in the Publix parking lot? It actually arrived in the parking lot prior to the victims. And about what time was that? It was a, just after about 3 a.m. And when do you first see this individual that's not one of the victims appear on the surveillance video? Uh, the person that parks that vehicle gets out and you can see that there's movement around the vehicle. Um, you don't see him again until he is moving back behind the shopping center on the other surveillance footage. And approximately what time was that? That was about 3.13, 3.15 a.m., I believe. And were the, had the victims, had they appeared on the surveillance video at this point? Yes. And about when did they appear on the surveillance video? I believe that they appeared at 3.12 or 3.13. At that time, it did not appear that way. And then what happened next? It, that we can see on the surveillance video, um, the next thing that we knew that happened, we were able to discover that one of the victim's um, cards had been taken, her debit card, and used at a gas station in Woodstock. So we were able to obtain that surveillance footage as well um, and get a proper vehicle description that matched um, the footage that we had previously from afar. Okay, so following your on scene, your crime scene investigation, what did you do next? Um, I did make contact. I was notified that there were families of missing children uh, on scene, and I did make contact with those families and let them know the nature of the investigation that we were conducting, although at that time I could not provide them with the identification. And then what happened? May I refer to my notes? Uh, yes, please. I had returned to the command post um, and we had discovered an associate of who we believed the female victim to be um, and we started looking into that person. And who is this person? His name is Grant Thalen. Um, he was in, we were notified by friends of Natalie that he was someone that she had been seeing on and off maybe for the past several months. And this was a few hours after the crime scene investigation when you learned this information? It was as the scene was being processed, but I was gone from the crime scene. So what did you do with that information? We made contact with Mr. Thalen. And you interviewed him? We did. And what did he tell you during this interview? Um, he explained the nature of their relationship, that it was not a boyfriend-girlfriend relationship. It was a friendly relationship between the two of them. Um, and he answered all the questions that we had as far as where he was and where he had been and where he had gone. And was he cleared as a suspect? He was. And what did you do next following your interview with Mr. Thielen? Um, it was the following day was when we received the information about the credit card usage. It posted to her account and her family notified us immediately um, and followed up with the gas station. And where was this gas station? It was located in Cherokee County and off of Highway 92. And you testified earlier that you obtained some surveillance video from this gas station? We did. And what was significant about that surveillance video? We were able to see the vehicle clearly um, that the suspect was driving. Uh, we were also able to see that it was the same suspect dressed the same way as on the other video. Um, we also observed that the suspect was wearing a mask when he was pumping his gas there. What kind of mask? It appeared to us to be um, initially a white mask with some sort of coloration on it, very similar to the mask in the movie V for Vendetta. And from the 
surveillance video that you recovered from 885 Woodstock Road, was the suspect depicted in that video also donning a mask? In the second time when he returns to the crime scene after he used the card to get the gas. And was this the same kind of mask that you noted from the gas station surveillance from the Cherokee County location? It did appear to be the same mask. And so what did you do with this information? Um, we were able to determine what type of vehicle we had at that point just from observing the surveillance footage. Um, we submitted a request to the GBI for an offline search for and, those. And what type of vehicle was that? It was a Honda Passport, I believe. And how were you able to determine that it was a Honda Passport just through visual examination? Yes. Some detectives with better eyes than mine and more familiarity with vehicles were able to look at the type of taillights and the positioning of the trunk latch and, and able to Google it and determine what kind of car it was. And now when was this? How, how, what day was this following the day of the homicide? This would have been the, the following day. This would have been August 2nd. And you said that you did a GBI offline search? We did. And what's that? Um, we submitted to the GBI and request, requested vehicles. We weren't sure exactly which year it was, um, so a couple of years of Honda passports that were either silver or white um, that were registered in Fulton or Cherokee counties. And what did you find? Um, detectives going through there were able to locate um, Mr. Walter Hazelwood, uh, who is the registered owner of the vehicle, and pieced together that he had had problems with his grandson previously. Uh, when they looked into the grandson, they observed that he was very fitting with the description that we had from the surveillance video. So then what did you do? We attempted to locate Mr. Hazelwood. And where did you do that? Um, his grandparents' house was checked. Uh, the vehicle was not at the grandparents' house. Uh, we were able to use social media to link him to a female that lives in Cobb County. Um, they went to that Cobb County address and located the vehicle parked out front. And that was the Honda Passport? Yes. And when was this? This would have been late night, early morning, uh, Wednesday. Overnight, Tuesday night. Okay. And then what happened next? Um, early morning hours uh, after 5 o'clock. Someone entered that vehicle from the residence uh, and drove down to a gas station at the corner of Highway 92 and Mabry Road. Surveillance was uh, following that person to the gas station. Um, the person went inside the gas station, made a purchase, came back out, headed towards the vehicle, but never got in. Um, started walking around the vehicle and walking around the back of the gas station. Uh, odd behavior, changing his clothes, taking his shirt off in the parking lot. Um, at that point, the decision was made to go ahead and detain the person that we believed to be Mr. Hazelwood. And was that person Mr. Hazelwood? It was. Jeff Hazelwood? It was. Okay, and then what happened after he was detained? Uh, Mr. Hazelwood was detained and brought back to the Roswell Police Department for questioning. Um, search warrants were obtained for his vehicle and that female's residence in Cobb County. And was there anything recovered pursuant to these search warrants? Yes. What? Uh, inside the vehicle, we did find a V for Vendetta mask. Uh, that was actually observed prior to getting the search warrant. We could see it through the window. Um, we could also see a small red gas can um, that was in the back seat that we had seen at the gas station. He filled up his car and a small gas can that you can see in that surveillance video. Um, pursuant to the search warrant, we also recovered a 9mm firearm out of the back of the car um, and several other items that were consistent with things that we had seen throughout the case. And what kind of firearm was that 9mm? Uh, it was a Sig Sauer. And you testified earlier that you recovered a projectile from the crime scene? We did. And have you been able to determine if that projectile matches that Sig Sauer 9mm? That has been sent to the GBI, but it's my understanding that it's consistent with coming from that type of gun. Okay. And so you also interviewed Mr. Jeff Hazelwood? I did. And did you Mirandize him? I did. And did he waive his right to remain silent and his right to an attorney? He did. And what did he tell you? Um, in the initial interview with Mr. Hazelwood, um, we talked a lot about his family and life and all of that. Um, when we finally got up to the incident, Mr. Hazelwood told me initially that he was present during the entire incident. Uh, he told me that he saw everything that had occurred except for the person that shot the victims.
And what did he s describe that he saw? Uh, he described that he saw the bodies fall and how they have how they had fallen. Um, he described that he saw that the girl was not wearing any clothing. Um, he described the vehicles. He admitted to going into the vehicles and taking items from them. What items did he take? He did take the debit card uh, from Natalie's vehicle from inside of her purse. And he admitted to that? He did. Okay. And he did it maybe in the second interview. Okay. We did two interviews with Mr. Hazelwood, um, but during the interviews he did admit that he took the card and used it. Okay, so let's get to that second interview. Okay. What, what day was that? That was the following day. That was on the 4th. And did you Mirandize him again before that interview? I did. And did he waive his rights to remain silent and his right to an attorney? He did. And what did he tell you during the second interview and how did it differ from what he told you during the first interview? The second interview, um, we went over the same information that we had done the day prior. Um, and this time, Mr. Hazelwood started his story with he had driven someone else to the scene and they instructed him to do everything that he did to the victims. Um, as the story progressed, he started saying that he did these things and using the word I and, and taking responsibility upon himself for doing them. And what things did he say that he did? Um, he admitted that when he originally observed the vehicles, he became curious as to why they were going behind the Publix. Um, so he followed them back there. Uh, he admitted to watching them from behind an electrical box for some time. Um, he then told me that he climbed on top of the store and watched them from the top of the store. Uh, and then he decided, or this person, told him to confront them. So he went over and opened the back seat of Natalie's SUV, the, the back area of her car where both of the teenagers were inside, um, pointed the gun at them and told them to get out of the car. Um, at that point, he said that there was an exchange between he and the male subject, and he hit the male subject with the gun as he was getting out of the car. Um, he said at that point, he was demanding the female get out of the car, and he became scared of the male and shot him. And he said that he fell right there. Um, he said at that point, he ordered the female out of the car. At that time, he said she was wearing a shirt and underwear. Uh, he made her get out of the car. He made her take her clothes off. And um, at that point, he said that he assaulted her sexually by digitally penetrating her. What do you mean by digitally penetrating her? He said that he put his fingers inside of her vagina. And what else did he say? Um, he said at that point, um, he got the female out of the car and made her lean over the hood from the side of the car. And he said that he spanked her. And was she still alive at this point? She was. And what else did he say? point he said that he shot her and, and she fell next to the car and where did he shoot her in the head and did you review the autopsy report in this case I attended the autopsy and what did the medical examiner find with regard to Miss Natalie Henderson she had a gunshot wound to her head what part of her head front or back it was the in the top right area of her head and was there any evidence to corroborate Mr. Hazelwood's claim that he digitally penetrated her? Um, what we were able to see in the autopsy is that um, Natalie did have blood smears on the inside of her thighs. And was there any evidence of injury around that area? There was not. And what did the medical examiner conclude was Ms. Henderson's cause of death? 
Uh, her cause of death was a single gunshot wound to the head. And what was missing? According to the medical examiner, the manner of death from Ms. Henderson. Homicide. And what did the medical examiner find with respect to Mr. Carter Davis? That he died of a single gunshot wound to the head. And what was Mr. Davis's manner of death? Homicide. And did Mr. Hazelwood view the surveillance video from the grocery store? He did not view the video. I did show him um, some still shots. And did he recognize himself in those still shots? He did. And did he explain why he made those purchases with Ms. Henderson's debit card at the gas station in Cherokee County? He said that his car was almost out of gas, and he filled up his gas can in case it ran out of gas later. And that was all he purchased at the gas station? Yes, sir. And what about the jumper cables? He said he took the jumper cables in case his car broke down later and he needed to use them. And did Mr. Hazelwood explain why he killed Carter Davis and Natalie Henderson? No. Throughout your investigation thus far, you've been able to discern any motive at all? At this point, no, nothing specific. Now that Sig Sauer 9mm that you recover from Mr. Hazelwood's car, is that a revolver or is that a semi-automatic pistol? It is a semi-automatic. And you testified that you recovered a single projectile at the crime scene? We did. And what about shell casings? Uh, the shell casing, we did recover shell casings out of Mr. Hazelwood's vehicle. But not at the crime scene? Not at the crime scene. Would it be customary for a semi-automatic pistol to eject a shell casing when it's fired? It would. Were you able to determine why there were no shell casings at the scene? It was clear that they were collected, cleaned up. And was there any evidence that you gathered in your investigation that indicated that Mr. Hazelwood would know to do that? Uh, Mr. Hazelwood um, writes a lot. We found a lot of writings uh, when we did a search warrant of his bedroom and his bedroom at his grandparents' house and also his vehicle. Um, one of the writings that I know about, uh, he describes wanting to be an assassin um, and how he would go about fulfilling that role. And were you able to obtain any cell phone records for Mr. Jeff Hazelwood? We were. And what, if anything, did these records reveal? Um, what I know of the records uh, is that his phone did hit off of the tower that is nearest the Publix. Um, sometime shortly before the homicides occurred. And what does it tell you that his phone was heading off the tower nearest the public shortly before the homicide occurred? He had to be close to that tower. So he was using a cell phone tower that was in the area of the crime scene? Correct. And where is Mr. Hazelwood today? Seated behind you. And what's he wearing? He has on the blue jail jumpsuit. And can you please point to him? He's right here. May the record reflect that Detective Bennett identified the defendant, Jeff Hazelwood? The record will reflect. Now that 9mm 6 hour, were you able to determine who owned that gun? Yes, sir. Um, in one of the interviews with Mr. Hazelwood, uh, he said that he stole it from his grandfather's truck. And did you speak with his grandfather? Yes, I did. Well, I did not, but yes, we did. And what did his grandfather advise? Uh, his grandfather advised that the gun that he kept in his truck normally was missing. And did the, and did Mr. Hazelwood live with his grandfather? Yes, he did. And where was that? It is in the city of Roswell, in okay. Fulton County. And. Did his grandfather have any information pertinent to this homicide? He did. Um, he and his grandmother both described being afraid of Jeffrey um, for a very long time. Uh, he had stolen firearms from them in the past and expressed homicidal and suicidal ideations. And were you able to recover the jumper cables? We were. And where were those? Those were located in Mr. Hazelwood's vehicle. And during the autopsy report, in background, Mr. Hazelwood stated that he pistol whipped Carter Davis at one point. He did. 
Were you able to find any evidence of blunt force trauma, uh, apart from the gunshot wound to his head, but any evidence consistent with Mr. Davis sustaining a blunt force injury to his face? No, we were not. Thank you. Cross-examination, right. Mr. Jacobs. Thank you, Your Honor. Mm -hmm. Good morning, Mr. Bennett. Good morning, sir. I want to start out by talking about the crime scene. You had mentioned this was a, pub, a shopping center, so there's a public from one end. Yes, sir. And then it's a long shopping center with a lot of uh, small shops. It's actually an L shape. L shape. So this Publix is one side of the L shape, and there are several other shops on the other side, and then there are standalone shops and banks out in the parking lot. Okay. And then there is a separate road behind it, which is where you go back for delivery trucks and behind all the shopping center. Yes, there is a circle that goes around the back. Okay. And behind the area where delivery trucks come, there is a fence, and then there's a wooded area behind that, correct? There is. Okay. Do you know, you said, I believe, on direct examination that Natalie and Carter arrived at about 3.13 that morning? Is that correct? I believe, it, yeah, it was close to that. Okay, and you saw on how many surveillance cameras could you see their cars when they came in? We could see them on um, four. I think. Four different surveillance cameras picked up their cars? Yes. Okay. When they parked, when they eventually parked their cars, were they, was that on surveillance at that point? They were parked? No, that was not in the camera view. Okay. How long after Natalie and Carter arrived did Jeffrey arrive on scene? About a minute. Did Jeffrey say where he was right before that? Um, he gave me a couple of different stories. Um, I know that a short time before, he was at a Waffle House in Cobb County. And you said this, the actual shooting was not on surveillance? That is correct. Okay. Is there any evidence that you have that Jeffrey knew either victim that night before he encountered them? Um, we have some connections, uh, but maybe not a personal knowledge of each other. What were those connections? Uh, Mr. Hazelwood is friends with a male subject that Carter knew from school. What is his name? Uh, Mr. Peel. P-E-E-L. P-E-E-L. Yes. And that's a student at the high school with Mr. Davis? I believe he's still a student there. Okay. Have you talked to him? I have not. Okay. Let's talk about the location of the vehicles. Where was Natalie's vehicle? Was that in a parking space? It was. Okay. Where was Carter's vehicle in relation to Natalie's vehicle? There was an empty parking space in between them. They were both in, it was all in three spots. In three spots. And where, which car was Natalie and Carter in when uh, they were together? They were in her vehicle. In her vehicle. And what kind of vehicle is that? It is an SUV, a small SUV. And do you know where Jeffrey's vehicle was when he first encountered them? Where did he stop? Did he park next to him or? No, he parked in a parking lot that's over on the side of the shopping center. So he would, no one would have been able to see each other. See each other. Right. And you had said um, that he got on top of an electro bo electrical box. Yes. Where was that at? How did Be he get up there? Behind the Publix. Okay. He said that he scaled it. And I said, like, Spider-Man? And he said, yeah. Is it possible to scale it? Um, we did have detectives go and climb up on the roof of Publix. So he could, so it is possible to get on from the electro box to the roof of Publix? As far as I understand. Okay. Anything on surveillance camera showing that he ever got on top of the electrical box? No, sir. Or the roof of Publix? No, sir. Okay. Is there any evidence, you said that on direct that at one point Jeffrey got in Natalie's car to take her purse or her wallet. Correct. Is there any evidence that he was in either car besides that? Was he ever in Davis' car? Yes. Okay. How do you know that? He took the jumper cables out of the car. Okay. In relation to, in, to Mr. Davis, you said that on direct that when Mr. Davis opened the car, they had some words, and he pistol whipped them. That's what Mr. Hazelwood told me. With Mr. So Mr. Davis was standing in the doorway of the car. More or less. He described he was getting out of the car. So I don't know if he was standing or still sitting, but the door was open. And he was getting out, is how Mr. Hazelwood described it. And to your understanding, that's where Mr. Hazelwood shot Mr. Davis? No, sir. Um, we, 
any explanation for that that Mr. Hazelwood provided is as he hit Carter with the firearm, it went off. So he fired around at that point, but it did not hit anyone. Um, crime scene evidence indicates that he fired the round into the ground. There's um, evidence of that that he fired into the ground? Yes. Okay. Um, so there was a shot fired there, but no one was hit with that shot fired there. When did Ms. Where was Mr. Davis when he was shot? He was closer over towards his vehicle. Um, on the driver's side of it? or No, on the passenger okay. side, rear corner of his vehicle. And that's where he was shot? That you believe? The approximate area. Okay. Okay. Did Mr. Uh, Hazelwood, after Mr. Davis was shot, is there any evidence that Mr. Davis's body was moved from one location to another? Um, there are changes in the blood spatter patterns, um, but I cannot. What were those changes? There, there's different movement in the patterns of the blood. So it's possible that he was moved or he And I know this testimony is tough to handle. You had mentioned when Ms. Henderson was had her hands on her car and you had said that Mr. Hazelwood had spanked her. Yes. Is there any evidence that you could see from that? Um, the, the cooperate that? There were some markings on her behind, um, but I, I don't know that you could clearly say that's what they're from. Okay. Where was Natalie's wallet when Mr. Hazelwood came back on scene and get it? Was it in her console in her car on her person where was it he had said um, he described that he got the debit card out of a pocket inside of her purse that had been sitting on the console um, that he didn't know anything about her wallet but we still have not located her wallet to this day okay. I want to go back The first time that he was back there was approximately 20 minutes. 20 minutes. And you could see his car leaving about 20 minutes later. Correct. Minutes. Yes. When, how long after that did he come back on scene? It was about an hour, maybe a little bit more, a couple minutes more. Do you have any knowledge based on cell phone evidence or anything about where he was with the, during that hour? Cell phone evidence, no. Um, but we have him at the gas station in Woodstock um, just after 4 a.m. So when did he come back on scene to take Natalie's wallet? He took the wallet the first time. He took the wallet the first time? Yes. My, my understanding is he testified that he came back on scene at some point after he initially left. He did. When was that? Um, that was approximately an hour later after 4. So if he arrived on scene at, say, 3.15, he was back there until 3.35 approximately. Mm -hmm. He came back on scene about 4.35? I believe so. Okay. And how long was he there that time? He was there about seven minutes the second time. And you said that time you saw him running with a mask on on surveillance tape? That's correct. Okay. When he left, he was running. Okay. And what, did he, what was he wearing when, he, when you saw him running on camera? Um, he was wearing the mask, still the dark jacket, still the red shirt, light pants, and dark shoes. Did you see his car ever come on surveillance that time, or you just saw him running behind the Publix? I believe that we have video of his car, not on the public's video, but on another surveillance camera pulling into the public's parking lot. Oh, I'm sorry. We do. We have him leaving the public's parking lot from that incident. Oh, so the second time he came back on yes. the scene, you saw him running, and then you also saw his car leaving yes. the public's parking lot? Yes. Okay. In regards to the gas station, how, what time did he arrive at the gas station in Cherokee County? I don't know the exact time, but it was... I believe just after four o'clock. Just after four o'clock, wouldn't he have? So he so he took he went to the gas station in Cherokee County and then came back to Roswell. Correct. Okay. And you said that when he was pumping gas, there was a surveillance camera that he had on the mask the entire time he was pumping gas. Yes. Did you interview the people at the gas station? I did not. Another detective did. Okay. Do you, you have any knowledge about what they said or if they had any conversation with them? No, no one made contact with him while he was at the gas station, um, and I have not heard that any of the clerks even realized that he was out there. Describe the mask again. You said it was a V for Vendetta mask. Describe what it looks like, but I'm not familiar with that. Um, it's a white mask. 
um, and I believe it has a mustache. It's uh, a mask that covers his entire head. It covers the front of your face. It oh, has okay. the strap that goes around the back of your head. Okay. Um, it has like rosy cheeks on it, and then it has the outline drawing of eyebrows. It looks like a person's face, but really white. Okay. Um, and, and, and you're not aware if he had that mask on the first time he came at 3.15 in the morning? It does not appear that he had it on at that time. Okay. Do you know if Jeffrey has any prior convictions or any prior arrests of any kind? As far as I know, he has no criminal history. Okay. And you said that you had a search warrant took Jeffrey's phone, cell phone? Yes. And you know that he was near the area because it pinged off the cell tower? Correct. In regards to the search warrant you served on Jeffrey's, you served a search warrant on Jeffrey's grandparents' house, is that correct? Correct. And you went in his bedroom and you said there were a lot of drawings and writings. That's correct. You said one of them talked about that he wanted to be an assassin. That's right. What other drawings, what other evidence did you see from his bedroom? Um, there were electronic devices taken from his bedroom. I believe a couple of pieces of clothing and a couple of jackets were taken from the bedroom. Um, other than that, I don't... I don't know what else was taken. Any other, any of that relevant to this case, to your knowledge? Um, we believe that some of the clothing may be. Jeffrey indicated that he did go over to his grandparents' house after he committed this crime. Okay. He went over to his grandparents' house after he committed the crime before he went to Cherokee County or later on in the day? I am, we were never very clear on at what point he went. Did his grandparents say? Overnight, though. He said Did, yes. And what did, um, did you serve a search warrant on the house? We did. And what did you find there? Um, we found more writings <coughs> um, of Jeffrey's um, electronic devices there as well. Um, I, I'm not sure what else we took from there. Those are the things that I definitely know about. Did you interview Kelsey? I did not. Other detectives did. Do you know anything about the substance of that interview? Um, not much. Were there any illegal drugs of any kind found on scene behind the Publix that night? Behind the Publix, no. Okay. Were there any, have you tested Jeffrey, did he, was, did he have any illegal drugs in the system? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Did you interview anybody in this case, or did Roswell Police interview anybody in this case that worked with Jeffrey at either one of his two jobs, at Michaels or Walmart? Yes, both. And what did you find out there? Um, we found out that People thought that he was a good employee, that he was very nice to customers. Um, he did have a disciplinary action, I believe, at Michael's, um, where he didn't smile at a customer, and a customer didn't think that was very nice. Um, at Walmart, they said that he's a regular person, and he always showed up on time for work. He was going to be late. He would call and let them know um, that he was just a regular employee. Did you talk to Jeffrey's grandparents about the 24 to 48 hours before the shooting about Um, the deadline for him to get out was August 1st. So that was a Monday, August 1st? Correct. And so he was kicked out over that weekend and told he had to be out by August 1st? Right. Um, in the conversation with Mr. Hazelwood, he indicated to me that he had already basically moved out of there. He had already moved all his belongings, so he was gone before that date of the 1st. When did he move his belongings out? He said that he had been moving them out over the since his grandparents told him that that was going to be the last day that he could be there. Um, he said he just started loading things into his car. Did his grandparents say when was the last night he slept at their house? I do not know that. Okay. What other witnesses are there that you've interviewed in this case? There are a lot of people. <laughs> um, lots of friends and family. Um, friends and family of, obviously, the victims. Right, yeah. and of Mr. Hazelwood as well. Who have you interviewed that is friends and family of Mr. Hazelwood, besides his grandparents and Kelsey? Right, we've tried to contact, we've, yeah, we've gotten in contact with Kelsey, um, and we are trying to get in contact with the rest of his friends and people on Snapchat trying to identify who people are. And you, did you personally interview his grandparents or did somebody else? I did not. There were other detectives at their house. Okay. What you, you were referencing something earlier. What was that you were referencing? It's just a very basic overall summary 
of, of what what we've done so far. Okay. Some of what we've done so far. I want to talk about you alluded to on direct that you interviewed him or, or Jeffrey's interviewed one time the first day and then at least one time the second day. Yes. Okay. I want to talk about this. Okay. Who the first time you remember the date and time he was interviewed? First day um, was August 3rd. That was the date of his arrest. Um, and I believe we started the interview sometime late morning. And you know who was in that interview? I was. Was anybody else in that interview? They were not. Was that interview video and audio recorded? It was. And on direct, you said that you um, read Mr. Hazelwood's Miranda rights. Correct. Did he understand his Miranda rights? He said that he did. Did he ever ask for an attorney? At the end of that first interview, the end of that day, he did. And who did he ask for? Did he ask for anybody specific? No. He said he wanted one of the people from court on TV. Do you have knowledge that an attorney came during that first interview and said that he wanted to meet with Mr. Hazel? During the interview, no. Do you know, have any knowledge that an attorney came to the Roswell Police Department at any time during that first day and requested to speak with Mr. Hazel? Yes, there was an attorney that came much, much later in the evening, like 11, 30, 12 o'clock at night, I think. So you're saying the first interview was in the morning, about 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning, and this attorney didn't show up for 12 hours? Right. Okay. Do you know who that attorney is? I can't remember his name right now. And you didn't talk to him? I did not. When you talk to that first interview was the first day when you rested all of that attorney? I think it was about three or four hours. Well, describe it every minute. Do you want your attorney here? Yes. And what did he say to that? He said no. Okay. Um, we had a very long conversation about it on video and audio recorded an attorney. prior to the interview, yes. And all that conversation, or some of that conversation about the attorney is on video? All of it is. All of this. okay. And you said during that second interview that he said that somebody forced him to do this? Correct. Who is this person? Um, initially, he said he didn't know who it was. Uh, then he told me a story about some guys that he met and finally landed on the name Matt. Matt. Okay. What did he tell you about Matt? Um, he said that I guess he had originally met Matt in passing at a shopping center in Roswell um, and they decided him and another guy were all going to smoke weed together. He said him and Matt always smoke weed together or him and another guy? Matt and his friend and Mr. Hazelwood met in a parking lot and decided to smoke weed together. When? Uh, all the time or that night? No, I mean, that night a few months that. prior to this. Okay. He said this was back in the spring. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So, so the smoking marijuana is not anything related to this case as far as the time frame of this case? Just how he met Matt. Just how he met Matt. Okay. Have you um, researched Matt? Have you found Matt? Um, we do have a couple of people listed in his phone as Matt. Have you talked to him? I have not. Okay. Have you attempted to talk to him? Um, we have done some work on them. Okay. But you, to this day, you've not found anything out about who Matt is? No. Okay. Have you obtained Jeffrey's medical records? I have not. Did he sign a release allowing you to, to obtain his medical records? He did not. During your two interviews with him, did he exhibit multiple personalities? He did not. Okay. Are you aware that he's a diagnosed schizophrenic? I am not. Are you aware that he is diagnosed bipolar? I have not been made aware of that. Are you aware that he is diagnosed with sensory disorder? No, sir. Are you aware that he is diagnosed with Asperger's? No, sir. When you interviewed, um, or when the Roswell Police Department interviewed Jeffrey's grandparents, did they talk about the times he's been a patient at Ridgeview Mental Institution? I believe that they did talk about times that he had been in the hospital. And how long ago was that? Did they say when he was at Ridgeview? I am not aware of a time frame. And Jeffrey's grandparents, you said earlier, had been at times scared of Jeffrey. That's what, yes. Are they scared of him because of mental illness, or did they say? I'm not sure. Did you ever talk to them about mental illness? I did not speak to them personally. You never, you never reached out to them personally? Not personally. Certainly, Councilor. 
করেছে Any redirect, Mr. Sprinkle? No redirect, Your Honor. You may step down. Thank you. Thank you. Any other witnesses, Mr. Sprinkle? No, I'm going to stay, Your Honor. Any witnesses, uh, Mr. Jacobs? Uh, no, Your Honor. Closing? I would just put the facts right in front of it. Your Honor, the state respectfully requests that the court find probable cause on a total of 11 counts to include two counts of malice murder, two counts of felony murder, two counts of aggravated assault with a deadly weapon, one count of aggravated sexual battery, one count of identity fraud, two counts of misdemeanor theft by taking, and a single count of possession of a firearm during the commission of a felony. The evidence at the hearing showed that on August 1st, 2016, shortly after 3 a.m., Jeffrey Hazelwood went behind the Publix on Woodstock Road in Roswell and shot Natalie Henderson and Carter Davis in the head with a handgun. He had been stalking them from afar, from the Publix rooftop and other areas around the shopping center. This is by his own admission. He tortured Miss Henderson before he shot her. He bent her over the car and spanked her, and he also digitally penetrated her uh, immediately prior to shooting her. Well, Mr. Hazelwood at first stated that he just happened upon them and took the debit card and the jumper cables uh, after they had already been killed uh, and seemingly mocked the interview process as he spoke in a foreign accent. He would later reinitiate contact with lead detective Jennifer Bennett, and which he fully confessed, admitting to everything that he did. Uh, he did voice a defense of duress uh, there's no evidence at this time that there was anybody with Mr. Hazelwood, that this person, Matt, even exists. Um, and even if he did, duress, of course, is not a defense to murder. Uh, so the state believes that it has presented enough evidence today for the court to find probable cause on the 11 counts that I requested. And the state respectfully requests that the court find probable cause on those 11 counts. Thank you. Thank you. Anything further, counsel? Nothing further. The court has considered the testimony presented. The court finds probable cause on two counts of malice murder, two counts of felony murder, two counts of aggravated assault with a deadly weapon, one count of aggravated sexual battery, one count of identity fraud, two counts of theft by taking, and two counts of possession of a firearm during the commission of a felony. Case will be bound over. It is so ordered. Anything further, counsel? Nothing, Your Honor. Thank you. Case will be reset for September 9th for grand jury. Next case, please. Your Honor, may I approach? Ladies and gentlemen, most of all, the court, please make a seat.